I am glad to have accepted the invitation from the Gospel Sounders Ministry to speak on behalf of the principles of courtship from the Bible. I've chosen to go through what is entitled Isaac and Rebecca. It's from Genesis chapter 24. And while I was getting married or preparing to be married over 19 years ago, this was a very special section of the Bible for me. I like to be led by the Lord. I want my life to be led by the Lord. And so this story was what was helping in the principles to find direction and guidance as my wife and I were seeking to bind together for the rest of our lives. We want to grow old together. We don't want to just fall in what's called love today and then after a while that love wears off and you don't know how to endure. But we want to have the patience of the saints with one another. And so through the years, through more than 19 years, we've had two children and they are such a blessing. We're actually very good friends together, all of us. My wife, my son, and my daughter. We like to spend time together. We do worships together. We encourage one another. We have good times and we enjoy each other's company. So that's been a real blessing. I spend time with the Lord every day. My wife spends time with the Lord every day. My son and my daughter both individually on their own spend time with the Lord each day. They've been doing that since before they knew how to read. And I really believe that is a great way to prepare for not only life on this earth with the Lord, but also prepare for getting into what we call marriage. And so the courtship concept, can, a lot of principles can be found here in the story of Isaac and Rebecca. I've already asked the Lord to bless in my life, and I pray that he will bless in yours as well. So as you're in Kenya or perhaps somewhere else in the world watching this video, may it be that God blesses you with an opportunity to be patient, to wait for that person that God has chosen for you, and to watch for the providence that will lead you together with somebody that you can grow old together with. And so my wife and I have been through the working of being a full-time pastor, which is quite stressful. It can be. And I've been a missionary where we watch the Lord provide um, every single moment of every day for us when there was a little bit of money at first, but then there was no money for a time. And we just saw the Lord provide. So there have been times where we've had to move. I was a uh, teacher at a school. I was a pastor over that same area um, working as a teacher. I've gone to school while we have been married. Uh, I've been without work and we've had to move several times. So we've gone through a lot of stressors, but that's always brought us together and we've always been able to pray through the things that we have gone through. So whatever life brings your way, if God is first and you honor God and his son in your life and through the spirit that the father has sent, which is the spirit of his son, according to Galatians 4 verse 6, if you're able to dwell with the Father, the Son, and the ministration of the holy angels here in this world, you will be blessed. You'll be able to endure and you will have that patient saint experience as is referred to in Revelation 14 verse 12. So I'm going to go through a lot of the notes that I've put together with you here in Genesis 24. The notes are online. You're going to be able to see the link in the description below in this video and hopefully you will be more prepared as a result of going through this study and the next part, because I think this one's going to be kind of long, that uh, you will be blessed and led to the one that God has chosen for you. And that's not a pie in the sky idea. I really do believe God has a first choice for you. So be patient and definitely search for God and his truth in your life. And as a result of you searching for him, then you will be brought more closely into his will and you will find that he blesses you in that search that you have for finding him and his way for your life. All right, so let's go right ahead and get into Isaac and Rebecca, the principles of courtship from the Bible. So Abraham was old. Let's say he was the ancient of days, right? He was well stricken in age and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So everything in this study with a bullet point is my notes you'll see that everything followed by one of the scriptures is taken right from the Bible. So Abraham, an aged man that we could say is blessed in, as the Bible says, all things. He was old and wise. He was mature, careful, instructed by the Lord, someone who it would be well for us to take counsel from. 
You don't want to go to your friends that don't know anything about life and ask them, like, should I be together with this person? Because they're going to be like, wow, she's really pretty or wow, he's hot, you know? So yeah, do it because then, you know, they're thinking about popularity. They're thinking about being cool. They're thinking about maybe that car or that motorcycle that they have or whatever it is that's going on. That is not how to find somebody. So go to somebody older, somebody you can trust, somebody who has yielded their life to the Lord and ask that person, what do you think? And you'll find that there is a lot of good solid counsel from some of the elder folks. You could even say mze in our lives, right? So what we have is in Genesis 24 verse two, Abraham said unto his eldest son of the house that ruled over all that he had, he said, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. So this is not just anybody. He's actually taking the eldest servant of his house. This is the one that he trusted to rule over all. Okay, so to his oldest, why is a servant? One who had been closest to him, even in his house, one that had the greatest amount of responsibility, ruling over all that Abraham had. The one honored and trusted, who was the most solemn instruction given he said, put your hand under my thigh. So we can see here that Abraham gave a command to somebody he really trusted in his home. So what happens is the oldest guy goes to his eldest servant and they are going to try to find somebody who is like that God had chosen for his son. Okay, for Abraham's son. Abraham already is somebody who loves the Lord and wants to follow him with his full heart fervently so that's the idea is we're going to those who truly want to serve god and follow him so verse 3 says i will make thee swear by the lord so abraham is saying to his oldest servant that he will make that servant swear by the god of heaven this is actually the one true god okay this is the father of our lord and savior jesus christ the god of the earth that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters that dwell in the Canaanites, or the land of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. So Abraham was a man who knew the God of creation. This was a man that understood who God is, and he was committing his oldest servant to do a very special work for him. Put your hand under my thigh. I don't know exactly what that custom refers to, but I know that it was a very solemn oath that Abraham was asking his eldest servant to go into, okay? So what we have here is that Abraham, he instructed his servant to swear, okay? And by these words, he was making a very serious request. He wanted his servants to know that what he was about to ask him was very serious. He did not want by any means in any fashion his son to marry someone that was a heathen. And the reason why is because if you have come together with somebody who you don't know the customs of, you don't know how the family was raised, you don't know the beliefs and... and the, the treatment that the father gave to the children, you don't understand what was the principles of child raising or diet or the way that they spent money or spent their time on the weekends. If you don't know those things and you don't follow after them, then what you're going to do is go through an experience that is very difficult, potentially, with this person you are connecting with. So it's, it's very important to have the same principles that you find in the Bible that... Uh, you've been raised up with or want to have your children raised up with so that you don't find yourself confused uh, when you're trying to lead your family one way and your spouse is trying to lead the family another way. So here we can see as we continue on, but thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. Abraham wanted someone who was associated with the same background, the same upbringing, who had had the same morals, knew the same God, and was familiar with his godly lifestyle, and as was his son. This would save a lot of trouble in the future for the young man named Isaac. You know, he was the only son of promise from the ancient of days that we referred to up there in verse 1. So, I mean, if you start putting those thoughts together that Abraham had a son of promise that was begotten of promise, and he was the only begotten son of Abraham by promise, you're starting to put together, wait a minute, the ancient of days and the only begotten son by promise, like what's going on here? So we're gonna continue with that thought toward the end, but we can see that in Hebrews, he was mentioned as the only begotten son. Well, we know that he wasn't the only begotten son because he, there was Ishmael that came before him, but he was the only begotten son by promise. 
You see, what happened is God was trying to bring forth a son of promise through Abraham and Sarah. And what happened is the enemy tried to obscure this idea and brought forth a son that was not of promise named Ishmael. And the whole thing was turned up on its head. But God still brought forth this son by promise because he wanted to fulfill a mission that he didn't want Abraham and Sarah to mess up, you know, with Hagar, etc. And so if we commit to someone who does not worship the same God, what turmoil could be in the home? We don't know what kind of activities people will lead your children through in the future if in fact the Lord doesn't come and you have children, if they don't have the Lord of life as their foundation. So what if there's differences in conviction regarding upbringing your children or abortion, education or discipline, money management or worship? What about recreation or associations, business dealings, sexuality, dress or family matters? These things are important. You need to understand that God has plans. He has a conversation or a way of life for you and your family that he wants to lead you through in a way that is in concert with his perfect will. So the less differences that there are to begin with in a relationship, the better it will be. Many say that opposites attract, but frankly, that doesn't necessarily mean that God has brought them together, right? So be not unequally yoked with unbelievers, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. So now as we continue on, the Bible says, Genesis 24, verse 5, The servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land. Must I needs? Is it necessary that I bring your son again into the land from whence you came? Should I go to the heathen? That was the question. And you can see that Abraham was very serious about this idea. The servant was wise in asking questions. He didn't go ahead and just do what he thought was best. I mean, like, well, okay, well, if there's no woman there, I mean, where should I go? So uh, what he did is he asked questions. So the servant was wise, wanting to know exactly what the standards were of this ancient of days in this story that has an only begotten son of promise, you know. We need to go to him, the Ancient of Days up in heaven, to find out who it is and what it is that he wants us to do in this search for that person that will be for us or for our children or for a friend, etc., right? So we ought to take his example, the servant's example, and asking as many questions of not just ourselves but others as possible so that our own minds will be clear and we'll be able to know what the highest ideal is for us and for others in our future, right? So notice what Abraham said. Abraham said unto him, Beware thou, that thou bring not my son thither again. And so can you hear the solemnity in the voice of Abraham? Under no circumstances was he to go and find a woman from whence Abraham had come. He had come from the land of Ur, which is Babylonian. You don't want a woman from Babylon. You don't want the harlot sitting on that seven-headed beast in Revelation 17 being for you or for your child, right? So absolutely not. So in verse 7 it says, The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. I really like that because what God is saying through Abraham is God promised me that he's going to lead me to a certain spot. And so I believe God's promises and God is going to send an angel to direct my path, right? So angels are very involved in how God works with people's lives, okay? So the Spirit of God inside the angels, because they have chosen the Holy Spirit or Holy Mind of God, they will lead you in the way that you should go. It says it right here in this story. Trust God through his son, the only mediator between heaven and earth, to guide you with those angels that are mentioned in Genesis chapter 28, verses 12 and 13, in the uh, vision of Jacob while he was dreaming. So the father of the future groom, a man of God with the ability to look back and remember the ways that God had led him, one having a personal experience with the God of creation. This man recalled the promises of his heavenly Father. Unto thy seed will I give this land. So we don't want to go back to Babylon because he said, my children will receive this land. I don't want to go and get, you know, connection with that land. And so Abraham was 
very intelligent with where he was going and where he wanted his son to go as well. Abraham understood that his seed, not the Canaanite seed, was to be given the land that was promised. So the relationship that his son was about to get into was not allowed to change the design that God had for his son's life or for his own life. Now, you've got to understand, when one family is married to another family through a son and a daughter, those two families become connected in a way that they've never been before. And that can be very troublesome if, in fact, you have different standards, different plans, different uh, backgrounds, and different futures, and everything like that. So this is not just you know, two people with birds flying around their heads and hearts flying from them. This is about you are connecting two families and you are going to have to live together through the ceaseless ages, hopefully on this earth without divorce. That's the goal. And so Abraham was very intelligent and knew that. So while being willing to trust God through the ministration of the holy angel that God would send, and because of what had been said and done in his past experience, his own past experience, Abraham was able to look to the future with that same amount of faith. He shall send his angel before thee, he said. Notice the parent of Isaac had great trust and dependence upon the providence in finding a mate for his child. And this is really important that we too have that same faith, allowing our children to have the ability to make their own decisions along with godly counsel, if in fact they're willing. Like God has never forced me to be a Christian. I have seen the love, the care, the providence of God, and as a result, I have chosen to be a Christian. And that's exactly what we should allow our children to be as well. So we're not going to force our children into some relationship because it's going to benefit the family in some way. Absolutely not. What we're going to do, though, is pray and believe, knowing that God is going to lead his children if we are willing to follow. And he will not withhold anything from us that is for our good. Notice what the Bible continues to say. If the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son into Babylon again. So Abraham did not put God in a box, right? He did not say that it must be a certain way. It has to be like this or else. He says, listen, if God doesn't work it out in this situation, that's fine. Bring, her, bring my son or yourself back here. Don't be going into Babylon to try to find somebody. So he didn't say God has to find somebody at this time right now. Abraham was wiser than that. So he made it clear that if there was not willing submission on the part of the future bride, then the whole thing was off. Let's go find somebody somewhere else. The servant would be free from the oath that another path would be sought out for, and the servant was not allowed to take one of the heathen women for his son. I mean, just go talk to Samson if you wanted to know about that. Or go talk to Solomon. These are really serious studies that led people astray from God because... They were into their own desires and direction and their own findings as they were seeking for somebody to be a mate for the rest of their life, right? So I'm not into that. I think that God has blessed me with somebody who loves the Lord as much as I do. And we together, loving the Lord, have continued to be brought closer to each other as we are drawn closer to God and His Son. So... That's really what I want for anybody interested in this study, is be patient. Be patient with God, and he will bless you, right? So, Genesis 24, 9 says, The servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master, and swear to him concerning this matter. And so, con consecrating himself to the will of his master, the servant was solemnly committed to this challenge of co-working with providence. That is so important. God doesn't want to just do stuff and then you kind of just follow along. He wants to co-work with you. And that's why providence, impressions on the heart, answers to prayer, and the, his word, of course, his word most definitely is how God directs us. We have minds to choose his will, and God expects us to be able to use our minds in the best and wisest ways possible so that we will be intelligently following his direction, and that's where we're going to have the best life possible for us. So there's a paragraph break here. That's what this thing means. And in verse 10, there's a new thought. The servant took 10 camels. Wow, 10 camels. Of the camels of his master, and he departed. For all the goods of his master were in his hand. Remember, this is a very trusted servant. This is not some servant who's just a random choice. Hey, help me out. I've got to find a wife. This is like the most trusted servant, kind of like Joseph was in the days of Egypt. And he rose 
and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. So notice that the servant took 10 camels, and the question would be, why so many? Well, did he need that much food to get there and back? Well, probably not. Did he need that much water? Mm, probably not. This was most likely a dowry. A dowry is proof that you can afford the one you're asking to take to your home, right? So you see, the father of the bride-to-be would need to see clearly that this man, asking his daughter's hand for his master's son, had the ability to provide for her future. Very important. So remember, like, you know, in the Garden of Eden, sure, God brought Adam a wife, but God had first provided Adam a job. And so Adam had a job, and as a result, he was able to provide for his future mate or his future bride. And God worked it out that way in principle so that we can know that we too should have our lives in a good direction before we start trying to put somebody else into our lives because we're not going to just mess up our lives, we're going to mess up the life of somebody else as well, right? So if the son had no means by which to provide for the daughter, which is the future bride, he may not be mentally nor physically prepared to take care of somebody more than himself. So before God performed the marriage in the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam a job. Remember that. You can see it in twenty or uh, Genesis 2, verse 15, and 21 through 22. Also, it says that all the goods of his master were in his hand. So does that sound like another scenario we've heard of before? More about that at the end of the study. So this one servant had everything at the hands or from the hands of the Ancient of Days. Pretty interesting. So there's like one that has all the resources, one that is the begotten son of promise, and one that is the Ancient of Days. Are we seeing the Father, the Son, and the ministration of the Spirit there? I think we do. Of course, the ministration of the Spirit, we'll learn, of course, here in this story, is through providence and through the ministry of the holy angel that we were told would be sent. And so here in Genesis 24, verse 11, He made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw. And so that's a really good time to go out, right? Because it was a time when women would come out to draw water. And so the servant intelligently placed him where he knew that women would be. Now, this is not for his own interest. He's not going there to see who's the best looking woman for himself. He is there under the solemn oath of the Ancient of Days to find somebody for his uh, master, right? his master's son. That's what I was looking for. So at the time when women would come out to draw water, in the place where they would draw, that's where he sat. And notice what he did. He and all that were with him relaxed. It actually says that they came to the well and they knelt down without the city by a well. So they didn't go there and set up camp so that they can look and, and watch for every single person that would come by. He knew that this was a place where women would come. He believed that God would give providence and he set down his camels on their knees. He sat down. They were probably having some water. They were probably having some food, patiently waiting for the Lord to provide. He and all that were with him relaxed and the servant did not. I repeat, he did not actively search the cities for the one that, quote-unquote, God had chosen, right? The one that he liked. He was patient, mature, willing to watch God's hand move in that very serious decision. And so as we continue to read, it says in Genesis 24, 12, He said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me Godspeed or good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Notice, he said, O Lord God. That means it was prayer time. It's a very good time when you are waiting for a female friend in your future or a male friend in your future, based on the principles here, to be in prayer a lot. Prayer time is very important when you're asking God to come together, uh, bring somebody together with you for the future of your life here on the earth. It was to set yourself and stand ye still that he was praying, right? And what God would do was move at a time like this. This was now where you are not in charge. You are asking God to be in charge. While waiting, it would behoove us to follow the same example of the faithful servant and pray without ceasing, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. So notice carefully what was said in the prayer. Send me good speed. I think that's important because he did not ask that God would prosper his search 
as he introduced himself to every beautiful woman he would meet. No, 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 no. That's not how it goes. Send me good speed, the Bible said, as we had just read. He was asking that God would send to him someone of God's liking. Notice as we go on in verse 13. Behold, I stand here, I don't run around, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of men of the city come out to draw water. So again, I stand here. He was not actively looking. He was waiting. Very important. If we could get this one principle for finding a life partner, we would be all the better. The servant was praying that God would send him his choice. That is what this servant was doing so wisely. Believe the Bible. It works. Many times the reason why God hasn't sent someone as a life partner is because the one waiting was not willing to continue in grace. So the one waiting, the waiting time, is precious, and it should be greatly appreciated and used wisely. Take the servant's example and pray if you are waiting for a future spouse. Very important. So verse 14 says, Let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink, that she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast shown kindness unto my master. And this is really interesting, the request that he made. You can go read it for yourself again if you'd like to in verse 14. Notice that the servant actually put out a fleece before God. So the servant put out this fleece in prayer. That's something that we should be doing, remember, in prayer. And we ought to be careful about the fleeces we ask for, because like, for example, if we wouldn't feel right in asking like, God, if I should marry that one, then please have her give me a new red Corvette, right? That's not the way to do it. And so be prayerful and let the Bible be the judge. The fleece that he asked for, the servant did, it was to expose the character of the damsel. Would she prove to be industrious? Would she care for God's creatures and be kind to strangers? Would she do her request and duties with cheer? Would she be willing to go the extra mile? And would she do it without complaining? All in answer to this one fleece? That's a really good way to define whether or not somebody is Christian at heart or not. These were good quality traits to look for in a bride-to-be. So consider also that this would be, She that thou hast appointed. That's what the Bible says. She that thou hast appointed. So God has picked out someone for us all. And we do not even have to search the world to find that person. God will lead us together. Use that waiting time wisely. If God hasn't brought you together with somebody, it's not your time yet. Just continue in prayer and he will bless you with the one that he has chosen for you. That doesn't mean every single day is going to be happy and, and pure and holy and beautiful and lovely and glorious. No, there's times where it's very difficult. I'm trying in this message not to get into my own personal story, though I've got plenty of ways to show my own personal interaction with my wife before we were married and after we were married to give good principles and illustrations, etc. But I'm trying to just study the Bible this time. So using the example here of Isaac and Rebecca, we're kind of going through their personal story instead of mine. So as we continue on in verse 15, it came to pass before he had been done speaking that behold, like before he prayed, before he was done praying, behold, the Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. So before the prayer was even finished, God had answered. That reminds me of Isaiah 65, 24, right? Where it says that before you answer, before you ask, I will answer. So God sent to him the lady of his choice, not his choice necessarily. But really, that would be the choice of an honored servant who wanted to do the will of God. So God is often working invisibly and in silence. Don't be hasty, as God's purposes know no haste nor delay. Let's continue on with the story. In verse 16, the damsel was very fair to look upon. She was a virgin, and neither had any man known her. She went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. God did not do Isaac wrong for trusting his godly father to find him a spouse. 
On the contrary, the damsel was very fair. So she was not only a very moral woman and evangelistic, she had not known man out of wedlock. She kept herself pure for this time by her own choices and her own parental upbringing. Does that sound like somebody you'd like to have? Somebody who they've never given themselves to somebody else. They actually have honored themselves and honored the, the God of heaven, honored their parents, and they've, they've tried to keep themselves pure. Like, unfortunately, in my experience, I wasn't able to give that to my wife. But I can say that having given myself to the Lord, all of that history was wiped away, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, and I haven't gone back to that lifestyle. So really, if you, like me, haven't had that experience where you could give to your future spouse something that you could never give to another, then just believe that God has cleansed you and live your life for God 100%. So this is what the beautiful picture was and is if a person is morally upright. God wishes to keep us all pure before we are married for the sake of keeping our bodies pure, our consciences, and also our records in heaven. You can just consider Ephesians chapter 5 verse 3. So now I've never seen a picture singular, as it says here in the Bible, that she carried, but it was probably no, not much bigger than four to five gallons worth. She also was seen going down to the well. Now that means that she must have had to come up from the well, right? So that means also that it may have not been an easy task, not only to get the servant water, but also to give water to all the camels. So we don't read of her complaining though, it was important to note that we have someone who here is very fair in the eyes of this man. And we also need to understand that in this case, in the case of finding a spouse, you ought to be finding somebody who is very fair in your eyes as well. Being attracted to another is extremely important because we will be with that person from the day of marriage onward. That's God's plan. And many times people take the physical traits of their mother and their father. So for example, if you can see the mother or you can see the father and you could recognize that that person that you're planning to get together with has the physical physique of either the mother or the father, you will see what that person may look like in 20 or 30 years. Okay, I'm just saying it's a real thing. Yes, it matters. And so Genesis 24, 17, the, the servant ran to meet her and said, let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And the servant was caught in the moment and ran to meet her. He was excited. He was moved by the Spirit in answer to prayer to ask this young lady the question. And so in verse 18, she did say, Drink, my Lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. So she greeted him kindly. She hasted to fulfill his requests. So what we're seeing are good qualities, right? This young lady was looking good thus far, inwardly and outwardly. Remember, she was very fair to look upon. So in verse 19, when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. So now when she said that, this servant knew that he had asked that specific thing in prayer. And now he's wondering, like, is this really the one that God has laid out for my master's servant? And so this is just what he had prayed for in verse 14. Notice, until they had done drinking, he said, I have never personally watered a camel myself, but I'm quite sure that her pitcher, you know, the singular pitcher, was not enough to fill them all just by topping it off one time and bringing it to them, right? So she had to probably go several times to, f <laughs> to water 10 camels. Okay, I don't know how far they went from one place to another. I probably should do that study, but I haven't done it yet. But they went a, a distance anyways, and camels can probably drink quite a bit. I know that they can store water for a long time, and so they probably have the ability to really absorb a lot of water. And so she gave those camels without complaining in answer to his prayer as he had asked, and God was working out the details of his providence right before this servant's eyes and he was getting excited so it says in verse 20 she hasted and emptied her pitcher in the trough and ran again unto the well to draw water and drew for all his camels 
She hasted, ran again, and drew for all. You can see what it says there. This was a woman that was willing to go the extra mile for the one that she didn't even know. She had a missionary spirit, and that's really important to notice in this verse. She knew the principle that if you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And so that's in Matthew 25, verse 40. And so we go on now in 21. And the man wondered at her, and he held his peace to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. The servant was still displaying patience. He knew not if the Lord had made his journey prosperous because he did not yet know if this woman was Abraham's uh, kindred, right? From, her, from his country and from his kindred. This is teaching us that we cannot assume anything about God's providence and will. We must see the totality of a situation before we can rest in the fact that God is leading us. I mean, like, we pray for God to open doors, right? So if he opens a door, we're to go into it and through it. But if he closes that door, we're to take some serious consideration. Now, at this point, it seems that the door had been opened. He had prayed for her to be good looking, and she was. He prayed for her to be a missionary in spirit, and she was. He prayed for her to give him water, and she did. He prayed for her to give the camels water, and she was at this time. And so we see the totality of the situation starting to fulfill, but it wasn't finished yet. And so what if she had been stopped halfway through as she was watering the camels, and she said, you know, most of the camels have had water, and there's so many of them. I'm tired. I want to rest. Could you water them the rest? Would that have fulfilled his prayer as he had requested as one of the fleece uh, standards that he had set up? The answer would be no. This would not have been an answer to the servant's prayer in verse 14 earlier. So let's be careful not to be too hasty in any of our own situations because God may be leading to a certain point to give you a right or to give you a left instead of a straightforward. So we can't always be too sure. But in this case, it looks like it's all good, right? So let's continue learning from Abraham's servant. It came to pass as the camels were done drinking that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets from his hands, or for her hands, of ten shekels weight of gold. So the servant, very thankful for the service of the damsel, paid her with a golden earring and two bracelets. This was not a wedding ring. This was payment for the work faithfully done. So notice Isaiah later tells us that to take off the bracelets and the nose jewels, which the earring here may be referring to because you can go into the Hebrew and find that it's likely the same kind of thing that's referred to in Isaiah. But Genesis 24, 47, it was an earring upon her face is what it says. So Isaiah 3, 18 through 24, you can read that for yourself. And what's being said here is in verse 22 that we had just read. It's a description of what happened, not a prescription of what should happen in regard to adorning ourselves with things that God has called us to take off, right? So he actually paid her for the service that she did. He was honorable and not just sitting back and letting her go up and down this hill with water, watering his camels. He actually paid her and it was a great... uh, Uh, gift that he was able to give her in that payment. So as we go on in verse 23, whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge? So the big question here it is, whose daughter art thou? What if she had said, well, she was of one of the descendants of Canaan, then the servant's direction would have turned. This man would have prayed again that God would send him a different damsel. You see how that works? So we're not finished with this answer to prayer yet. I mean, it looks good, it sounds good, it seems good, but it's not finished yet. So in verse 24, we're going to continue on and see that she said unto him, I am of the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. Verse 25, she said moreover unto him, we have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. And the man bowed down his head, and he worshipped the Lord. Now, why did he do that? Because of what she said and whose child she is. And so he worshipped the Lord and said, Blessed be the God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth, I being in the way the Lord has led me to the house of my master's brethren. When he saw her willingness to house a stranger, and his prayer being answered, The faithful servant, what did he do? He bowed in reverence to the God of Abraham, thanking him for his providence again. And so we can see here that what Abraham 
the servant of Abraham was doing was seeing all of the pieces fit together. So we have a woman who is a missionary. She's good looking. She's from the right family. She has fulfilled the request that this servant had prayed for specifically in regard to the service of his animals and himself to be able to see a revelation of the character of this damsel. And it happens that all these things work out for the benefit of the entire family, right? So notice as we continue on in verse 28, it says the damsel ran. She was so excited. She'd already run before, but now she's running again. And she told them of her mother's house these things. Very important. If there are godly parents in your household, they should be involved in your potential marital relationship. Rebecca ran straight to her mother and told her all things that had happened. This is really important. This was a good testimony to the servant, of course, as well. He saw how she treated her family. You can know a lot about a person if from this one thing. If they are despising their brother or their sister or their father or mother, there's a lot of hate in their heart and they could potentially treat you or your children the same way, or perhaps your mother or your father or your sister or your brother. So we can't have families that are you know, beautiful, picturesque, Christian, loving, kind, connected with somebody who hates his father, hates his mother, etc. And just the two don't seem to mix together. Now, I understand if somebody comes out of a very dark place and is converted, and they've had years of testimony showing their converted experience, then perhaps the Lord may be leading them together. But I would still ask a lot of questions about that situation, right? So in this case, the woman's, this young woman or the damsel's parents were involved. In other modern cases, if you don't have a church family or somebody who honors the Lord as a father or a mother, then go to a church family, a spiritual person or a pastor, if there are no spiritual leaders in your own blood family. Very important to consider. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to break. We're going to call, uh, call for another time another session so we can have two parts because this one would be rather long otherwise and i just believe that god has shown us a lot of principles in this story of the ancient of days speaking to his only begotten son of promise asking the servant to go out and prepare a bride for the only begotten son of promise does that sound like the gospel to you well it sure does to me and so in your life if you're preparing for god to bring you together with somebody ask him to reveal the gospel in your life as well. Not just in the way that you're brought together like this story is going on, but certainly in the way that his providence is leading you, the answers to prayer, the impressions on the heart, the families coming together, the unity, all, everything. May it be that God's gospel is portrayed in your life and in mine. So I would like to pray asking God to bless you in your continuing search for the one that God has chosen for you. So let's bow our heads and ask for God's blessings as we continue to study, not only uh, in this first part, but also in the next to come. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us this opportunity whereby we could search the scriptures and try to find principles that matter we can find what it is that your Bible is saying, and we can understand a little bit more about how it can relate to our lives in this situation. There are a lot of people in this world that would like to be guided by you, God, and I pray that you would please do this. Help them to be servants seeking your will in your holy word and willing to be directed by you so that you can be glorified in their life. Thank you for this opportunity, and I do pray that as we continue to read your word, that we will be able to know and understand what it is that your spirit is saying to your church. Thank you for the illustration of you, the Ancient of Days, sending forth your only begotten son through your servants to be able to prepare a bride for your son. We see the gospel in this story and pray that you'd continue to lead us, that we can fulfill your gospel as well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.